Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting. So I'm going to start again. No problem. Hello. Go ahead. OK. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending. My name is Ernesto Diaz Flores. I am an assistant professor in the pediatrics department at the University of California, San Francisco. So today I'm going to be presenting um, a work that shows how we successfully characterize uh, leukemia um, from the very early beginnings to having a drug already in clinical trials. So hopefully this will give you an idea of the type of studies that um, will help identifying a therapeutic target and to bring it all the way to like preclinical and moving into the clinical part. So the title of my talk is Identifying Vulnerabilities in Hypodeployed ALL to be Exploited Therapeutically. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, is the most prevalent cancer in children and adolescents. Uh, it also accounts for the highest mortality. So in the five-year rate, uh, survival rate for children with ALL has great increase. So it's between 85 and 95, uh, 85 and 90%, actually. But the remaining 15% is still accounting for the highest mortality rate in this um, leukemia type, and it's due to particular subtypes that has a very bad prognosis, um, mostly because they have a high risk of relapse. So among those, uh, we have hypodiploid leukemia, and that is the topic of the presentation today, and that's where we've been focusing our effort, especially because being such a high-risk leukemia, uh, even if it accounts for only 2 to 4% of the cases, um, it really urges for new therapeutics um, to be found for these patients. So hypodiploid B cell leukemia is characterized for having less than 46 chromosomes. As I mentioned, it uh, accounts for 2 to 4% uh, percent of pediatric ALL, and is divided based on the karyotype, meaning the number of chromosomes. So it could be high hypodiploid, 40 to 43 chromosomes. We're not going to be discussing that because that has a similar prognosis that diploid leukemia. Um, but 32 to 39 chromosomes um, is called low hypodiploid uh, leukemia. And then they want to have like 25 to 31 chromosome is called near haploid. They never reach uh, like complete haploid D because they never lose chromosome 21 or the sex chromosome. So these two uh, subtypes, low haplodiploid and near haploid, are the ones that have like the worst prognosis uh, as compared to non hypodiploid leukemias. Um, that was described in Natsman et al. in 2007, but since then there have been some other publications and uh, like stressing this point. And this year, only uh, two publications, one by McNear et al. Uh, from the Children's Oncology Group, and another one by uh, Ching Hong Pui in, at St. Jude, they have shown the like poor outcome of this leukemia, and they have urged for new therapeutic approaches that could benefit this patient that do not have any alternative treatments so far. So, here it shows like a characteristic profile of hypodeployed patients. We did, uh, we started this work in collaboration with a, a group in St. Jude led by Dr. Mulligan um, to do the first large characterization of hypodeployed leukemia. So 124 patients were like um, analyzed and the studies that I'm going to be providing here came from that genomic characterization as well as the like uh, the rest of the omics characterization, characterization that we did. So here you can see um, the chromosomes on the left. Uh, by like you see the number that will represent the chromosome, and then each column represents a patient. So when we go to low haplodiploid, what we see is that all patients lose the same chromosomes. Uh, as you see, all or most uh, patients with a low haplodiploid lose chromosome two, three, four, seven, and so on. So the ones in blue. The legend indicates the uh, number of chromosomes. So if you see like um, kind of like white that represents a diploid karyotype, if it's half of that, uh, it will be in blue. Uh, if it's double that, so instead of diploid, it becomes tetraploid, that you will see that in red. So in low haplodiploid, you see out of the blue, like that represents the, the chromosome numbers that get lost. Um, 
And then what's interesting with these patients is that they can reduplicate the chromosome number. So if let's say that they had like 32 chromosomes, now they duplicate it and is what's called mask low haplodiploid. So the chromosome that was haploid, meaning just one of the two chromosomes, now gets diploid. So in a karyotype would look normal, apparently normal. But the one that were like still the two chromosomes in the low haplodiploid, now they are like duplicated, so they are four. So now look tetraploid. So what this makes is that uh, a patient that had like 32 chromosomes now has 64. Um, so that looks like a hyper diploid leukemia. But it's important to make the distinction between mask, hypodiploid, meaning that they duplicated the chromosome content, versus a pure hyperdiploid. And the reason is because the hyperdiploid patients have a better prognosis than hypodiploid. So initially, these patients were considered to be hyperdiploid, and they were put in a standard treatment, um, but they had a very high rate of relapse. So when they were found that uh, some of the hypodiploid could duplicate, so now it's a clear distinction between those two. And uh, well, once a patient is seen to be hyperdiploid, first thing that is done is to see if they are like mask hypodiploid or they are pure hyperdiploid. So the same happens in the near haploid. As you see in the near haploid, they lose almost all chromosomes. Um, they might preserve chromosome 14, chromosome 18, and chromosome 21, as I said, that it is not uh, like, um, it's never lost in these patients. And same for like the sex chromosomes. So in order to identify therapeutics that could um, tackle these leukemias, we need to understand how the protein gets deregulated. But for that, we did a whole omics characterization of these patient leukemias to try to identify potential targets. The way we did that is first we did a genomics characterization. Uh, that was published in uh, 2013 in a Nature Genetic paper that we did in collaboration with St. Jude. Um, first author is Linda Holmfeld. And some of the patient was subjected to whole genome sequence, whole exome sequence, or target sequencing. Most recently, uh, Charles Mulligan's group, uh, also in St. Jude, did another characterization of a larger number of leukemic patients. That was in the context of PAX-5. Uh, so it included 2,000 patients with different type of leukemias, but it also included 80 hypodiploid cases. Um, so between those two studies, we had the whole genomic characterization of those patients. Um, we also generated the transcriptomics data, either microarray RNA or RNA-seq. Um, that is a working process that we are analyzing to try to find um, the gene expression differences um, for these leukemias. And then uh, we did a proteomics characterization using protein profiling. That work we recently published uh, this year in Cancer Research. Um, and all three work in combination to um, complement each other to try to find these uh, potential vulnerabilities in this leukemia. So the genomic characterization of hypodiploid LL showed that low hypodiploid and near haploid are unique entities. So this addresses the question of is the patient first losing some chromosome and the cells becoming low haplodiploid, and then they lose more chromosomes and they become near haploid or not. Um, so this genomic characterization, what shows is that it's not. Um, so as you see, low haplodiploid, uh, like over 90% of those uh, leukemias has a mutation in P53, um, but yet you don't find that in the near haploid. Um, same for IKCF2, one of the transcription factors, in over 50% of the patients is not found in near haploid, and vice versa. Um, in RAS and IKCF3 are found in uh, near haploid, but not in low haplodiploid. However, despite having unique signatures, they affect kind of the same like group of pathways. So as you see, cell cycle, uh, P53, retinoblastoma, and CDKN2A and B are mutated um, in low haploid hypodiploid, near haploid has also CDKN2A and B alterations. Um, so that would be, and retinoblastoma as well. So that would be affecting cell cycle. Um, 
the RAS pathway uh, is both in LH and NH, like with neurofibromatosis type 1 uh, gene, but also in RAS and FLIP3 in the case of near haploid. Um, also, the epigenome it has like some role to play in this leukemia. Um, so, as you can see in this characterization. So, with this information, we try to see how can we translate this into like potential targets. Um, so then we decide to do a biochemical analysis of these leukemias, and for that we use a, like a characterization panel uh, looking at toroid proteins or activated proteins as phosphoproteins. Uh, we use um, flow cytometry to, for that, and the panel was generated using commonly affected um, proteins in like cancer, particularly in leukemia. So that includes the receptor tyrosine kinase pathway, p kinase pathway, RASMAP kinase, as well as protein synthesis, survival proteins, antiproliferation, and apoptosis. So before going to the analysis, I want to show you how we did the uh, protein characterization. Uh, we use phosphor flow cytometry. Um, for that, we implemented um, um, protocol that had been developed by Gary Nolan in Stanford. Um, so is basically taking the cells, fixing them with paraformaldehyde, primarily assisting with them with methanol, um, and then using antibodies to detect either surface antigens that will allow to look at subpopulation of cells. And then oh, also, a... yes? Um, yeah, your connection fell off. Um... There we go. You're back on. Okay. okay. Yeah, it fell off. Um, okay. So I'm going to start with the. Should I start with the slide or should I go one slide back? Um, I would say just start with this because it seemed like it started right when you started talking again on slide nine. Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, go ahead. Just count to five and then go ahead and start again. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So before going to the analysis that we did of these proteins, I want to show you how we. Um, uh, characterize the, the protein uh, levels. So we use a technology called phosphor flow uh, using flow cytometry, um, multi-parametric flow cytometry analysis of extracellular and intracellular antigens. This protocol was um, developed by Gary Nolan in Stanford. And what it does is you can uh, fix the cells using paraformaldehyde and then primarize them using methanol. So that allows to open pores but keeping the integrity of the cells so now we can use antibodies against the surface antigens, and that will allow to distinguish between subpopulation of cells, and then have intracellular um, antibodies that can recognize uh, intracellular proteins uh, simultaneously. So in this example here, you have like now we process by flow cytometry, and in a healthy cell, there will be not that many cells, uh, than many proteins that get activated upon a stimulus. So that will be shown in green. So in unstimulated or basal conditions, you will have like some levels of a particular protein or phosphoprotein. When it gets stimulated or the protein that gets uh, stimulated or phosphorylated will be shown in green. Um, whereas in the mutant, they tend to upregulate those proteins. So you have like more um, or you have a higher intensity. So that you can detect it by like an increase in the shift in fluorescence um, from the basal. And the basal might be already like higher than the basal in the healthy cell. So now we can um, transform that in a heat map. And then you can see how they, in this case, the basal conditions of the wild type and the stimulation compared to the basal conditions, the mutant and the stimulation, where yellow is upregulated and blue is downregulated. So now we can. Uh, go and look at the characterization that we did. Um, so here as columns, you see the different proteins, over 20 proteins from the different pathways. Um, and then on the left, every row represents a patient. So the first one is the healthy control that we use. And whichever labels the healthy control cells have, that's considered zero. And that's given a value or like a color of black. Any levels above the zero, the standard for like the control, uh, will be shown in yellow, and that means upregulated. 
Anything below that will show in blue, downregulated. So as you see, when we look at the um, low HAPO deployed patients, um, you can see the 53 is elevated because it's mutant, so it cannot be degraded, so it accumulates. Um, and there is some proteins like beam that uh, will show also like high regulated compared to the near haploid, and same for BCL itself. Um, but besides that, um, all the other proteins kind of show a similar pattern both in low haplodiploid and near haploid. So now we decide to see what happens if we um, block or inactivate using inhibitors any of these pathways. So next um, graph here we show, so we use uh, inhibitors against receptor tyrosine kinase, like that SAR kinase or JAK stat pathway, and the proliferation of the cells were not diminished. Um, when we block MAP kinase, surprisingly, that's the light blue, surprisingly didn't affect proliferation either, uh, which um, we replicate with additional uh, drugs. Part of that I'm going to show later, uh, but it didn't have any effect. Um, when we block PI3 kinase, here you see two PI3 kinase inhibitors in red and purple, uh, we have a reduction in 50% proliferation of these cells. But strikingly, when we block BCL2, um, as shown here in orange, we have a quick decrease in proliferation starting at 10 nanomolar. So when we look at not just proliferation, but induction of apoptosis, um, the ABT compound that blocks PCL2 was the only one that also induced apoptosis. So that tells us that PCL2 had like a potential uh, cytotoxic effect against these leukemic cells. So as I mentioned, we like replicate these uh, experiments with additional drugs. We include more map kinase. Uh, here I included two. We did up to five. Um, and we use up to 12 different pediatric kinase inhibitors, including isoform specific inhibitors for the different like uh, activated uh, um, catalytic activity um, like uh, subtypes. And we saw the same. We saw like a partial reduction of proliferation, um, but it was only with the ABT, and we use three different inhibitors for ABT: ABT263, ABT737, and ABT199 and all three had overlapping results in decreasing proliferation. Um, and when we compare uh, the increase in proliferation, even against um, chemotherapy agents, then we saw like a great increase of caspase or active caspase by BCL2 inhibition that we didn't see with any other drug. So we want to make sure that we were not biased by just looking at these drugs. So then we did an unbiased uh, screen using a small library um, that contains 94 compounds um, affecting different uh, targets and they, that they are like in different stages of FDA approval. So, and that um, result, like what it shows is one represents 100% proliferation and that has been shown with DMSO control. And then all these are like different like drugs and chemotherapy. And then if it goes to zero, that would be a hundred percent reduction. Um, so you see that ABT263, the BCL2 uh, inhibitor, was the only one that had like the, or was the one that had the highest efficacy. The next one was gemcitabine, which is a drug that has a very like broad spectrum, um, but it didn't have any specificity against a hypodiploid leukemia. Um, um, so then, as a small molecule, ABT263 was the highest scoring one, going uh, together with our results that I showed previously. So then uh, we uh, studied the effect of this drug in patient samples ex vivo. So we did at 24 hours using 100 micromolar. Um, like, and then we saw that all of the, uh, sorry, 100 nanomolar, all patients' uh, samples had a big, big um, decrease in proliferation, and that resulted in an increase of apoptosis, as shown here in blue, versus the untreated in red. So all these data, although in vitro, they were very promising and encouraging of the results that we're seeing. Um, not showing here, but we did a comparison between 263, which is a BCL2-BCLXL inhibitor, um, 
with 737 as well, and ABT199, which is specific for uh, PCL2. And what we saw is that all three had overlapping effects, so that indicates that the inhibition is due to PCL2. So we decided to see how that um, would have an effect in vivo. So we took patient samples, um, so four low hypodeployed, four near haploid, and three non hypodeployed leukemias. So each of the patient samples had different mutation profiles, and they were engrafted in six mice each. Once they reached an engraftment um, cutoff level, that was either 5, 10 to the 7 uh, with imaging, because these patient uh, samples were tagged with a luciferase recorder, or um, a, like 5% uh, blast presence in peripheral blood. So that was the cutoff to start treatment. So then they were randomly assigned to either vehicle or ABT. So the dosing that we use um, is after day zero one, they had like more than 15% in peripheral blood. They, uh, as I mentioned, like they were randomized and then we did a dose increase, 25 uh, mg per kg, 50 mg per kg, 75 mg per kg, all for two days each up to 100 mg per kg to avoid tumor lysis syndrome, which had been described for this drug. And then after one week of treatment, they kept in the 100 mg per kg uh, for the duration of the trial that was uh, 60 days. And every week we'll do uh, imaging as well as counting of peripheral blast uh, in, of blast in peripheral blood. So here you can see the monitoring that we do by flow cytometry. We use a mouse CD45 to detect if the blood is only mouse. So as you see, like this mouse has not been engrafted. Uh, but once they engraft, you see that CD45, they still have presence of the mouse uh, blood cells. But when you start seeing in the x-axis, uh, you still have human CD45 appearing. So in this case, goes all the way to like 32% of um, human leukemias already in the mice. So here then I show like different patient samples. This is just an example to show how the treatment worked. So that was at day zero. Um, each patient sample has different mutation profile. They were all treated um, at the same time with the drug. And then once like we analyzed at day seven, we see that it was completely clear uh, upon on treatment with ABT199. Uh, for all the leukemia in the mice. And this, I have to say, happened at 24 hours already. Um, so, and then uh, after that, like, we had, a, like, we, we saw, like, a very, like, rapid um, clearance uh, from both imaging as well as flow cytometry. So, at the end of the trial, 85% of the mice with low haplodiploid or near haploid leukemia that had been treated with ABT199 survived the treatment, uh, whereas those treated with vehicle died. And the control leukemias that were not dependent on BCL2, um, they didn't respond to either vehicle or uh, ABT199, and, um, as shown here. So as I said, like this was, uh, you can find this work in Cancer Research of March this year uh, for additional details. So this data um, help together with other like collaborating work, uh, helped open the first clinical trial for children with high-risk leukemia for the treatment um, using ABT199, either alone or in combination with chemotherapy. So in addition, we want to see what's the mechanism by why this uh, leukemia selectively responds to um, ABT199, also called venetoclax. Um, and if we could find biomarkers of drug response. So what we found, and this has been described uh, for this uh, drug already, that um, in order for like a cell to be sensitive to this drug, it requires to have high levels of BCL2, since this is a BCL2 mimetic. And as you see, the control leukemia that did not respond had lower BCL2 levels than low haplodiploid or even near haploid. But what was interesting is that we also saw that the pro-apoptotic protein, BIM, had very high levels um, in some of the leukemias, and, and in the ones that did not have high levels of uh, BIM, they have high levels of BAD. 
So what makes this leukemia so sensitive is that they have high levels of the pro-survival, but also high levels of the pro-apoptotic. So when you use a drug that blocks the pro-survival, then you have an outnumbered concentration of the pro-apoptotic proteins that will drastically like kill the cells in a very rapid way. So that you tip the balance in a way that um, the leukemia, the leukemic cells now are very sensitive to like death induced by the by this drug. So to prove that uh, beam and BAL are the mediators of that effect, we use CRISPR to eliminate beam in the cells that contain high levels of beam. And as you see, beam knockout one or beam knockout five completely eliminated uh, beam. So in those cases, that caspase activation induced by the drug is blunted, uh, completely blunted. Um, but if you keep some of the isoform beam, it's still happening. So that is a cell line that has high levels of beam on the left, NAM16, but um, BEG1732, they don't have uh, endogenous levels of beam, but they have levels of BAL. And then when you like use the, the drug, then you also induce apoptosis, as you see here by cliff caspase, even faster than what you see in, um, in the case of NAM16. Here, this uh, example was taken at 24 hours, so BAL uh, is already like knocked down, but we did further analysis, as you can see in the paper, where we did a short-term courses where BAM is still present and it gets induced, and that's when the um, BAL is mediating caspase. By 24 hours, apoptosis has already happened, so many of the proteins have already been degraded. Um, and then you, what you see is high levels of caspase, high levels of uh, cliff barb, as indication of cells already dying or like some of them are dead. So, but even in this case that they don't have beam, as I mentioned, they are like very sensitive to IBT199 and that was through the effect of BAL. So when we use CRISPR uh, analysis, we knock down BAL and then you see that the activation of caspase uh, by IBT199 gets also blunted. So this shows how um, the drug works and what's the, like, the effect on this uh, leukemic blast. But um, what we also observe is that although it has a great efficacy in clearing the blast from peripheral blood, here on the left is the control leukemias. There is no difference between V in blue and ABT in yellow or orange. In the uh, low HAPA deployed, they, at the end of the 60-day trial, only two mice had like about 5% of blast. All the others had zero levels. And near HAPA, we could not detect any leukemia uh, in peripheral blood. But when we look at the liver, the blasts were still resident there. So what it tells us is that these might become a reservoir for uh, blast, and when we stop the treatment, leukemia may come back because of the presence of the uh, leukemic clones still in internal organs. So we decide to do a combination therapy. So uh, here I'm just showing that um, in the PS positive leukemia, they don't have levels of BCL2 that we use for these pathology slides. Um, because of that, in ABT199, that looks the same, more or less. They didn't respond. But then low HAPA deployed and near haploid, they have high levels of the leukemias that are positive for BCL2 uh, before treatment and also after treatment, or with vehicle and with ABT. And that's where like they are still uh, lodging their the clones. So we need to find a combination therapy that could be synergistic with this drug, uh, in clearing not only from peripheral blood and bone marrow, but also from internal organs. So for that study, um, this is a work that we did. Like we, um, uh, I had a fellow in my group, uh, Holly Pariori, did most of these studies. And what we decided to do is use an unbiased high throughput drug screen to identify uh, effective drug combinations. So for that, we used the hypodeployed cell lines, NAM16, VEX1732, and MHH-CoL2. Um, we use Eight, like 
close to 2,000 compounds, bioactive compounds, including epigenetic compounds. And we look for uh, decreased proliferation as using a cell target glow assay as a screening uh, method. So from the 1950 drugs that we use, we look at the 18 uh, drugs that have the highest induction or, or highest inhibition of NAN16. So once we identify that, we look at them and they basically belong to like very few subgroups of or classes of drugs. ACE-DAC inhibitors, protosome inhibitors, anti immunotubular agents, mostly chemotherapy, and others, uh, including one here, dinacycli, which cell, like, it was considered to be a cell cycle uh, inhibitor. So then we use these 18 drugs against the other two cell lines, and then we did different time course, 24, 48, 72 hours, even 96 hours. Um, and then from those experiments, we chose the top six drugs. And then for those top six, we did in combination with also ABT. So the top six came to dinacycli, paclitaxel, cuisinostat, panovinostat, and bortezomib. But from those, the one that had the highest combination score, as reflected here in the bliss score column, uh, it was dinacycli. Dinacycli has uh, cell cycle um, targets as well as some transcription factors. So when we combine dinacycli with ABT, uh, you can see here uh, zero concentration of both drugs We have 100% proliferation, but as we increase already 16 nanomolar of dinacycli and eight nanomolar of ABT reduces proliferation by 80%. And, and of course, uh, even more drastically, uh, a higher concentrations. And then when you look at the bliss score, you see uh, the concentration where the bliss scores are higher, as, in, as indicated here by blue. So all these studies and additional in vitro studies that I'm showing here um, also encourage us to do a clinical trial with this combination, dinacyclic and ABT. Um, so this is like an example of a mouse that was uh, untreated, was just being given vehicle. And then the, this trial was 28 days, um, replicating the course of chemotherapy in patients. So the images are every seven days. As you see, the leukemia gets even more um, expanded, uh, more aggressive. Um, when we use ABT, we have a reduction, uh, but still be present in like at the 828. And that is particularly because of the liver presence. When we use dinacycli by itself, we didn't see much of an effect, although it reduces, but it's not a, like a drastic reduction. But when we use in combination, ABT and dinacycli had a great syner synergy and very synergistic effect, as you see here, um, and we could not find any blast in any of the tissues that we analyzed or by flow cytometry or by any means that uh, from the different analysis that we did. Um, so this is work in preparation, um, Pariuri et al. manuscript in preparation. We are expecting to submit in the next few weeks. Um, and then has additional details on how we did this screen, how did the uh, in vitro studies, um, the ex vivo, as well as the preclinical trial. So I hope that with this, I have shown you um, how to take uh, leukemia for what was very little known before we started characterizing it, to be able to characterize, identify potential targets from different avenues that all converge, um, and then how to do in vitro and ex vivo experiments to justify doing a preclinical study, and based on the very like drastic and uh, positive outcomes of the treatment that we identify, um, we're able to have venetoclax uh, being like given out um, a clinical trial for pediatric cases of ALL, of high risk ALL, and hopefully additional uh, treatment we're gonna be able to be informing in this way. So as conclusions, um, so a biochemical characterization of hypodiploleukemia was able to show upregulated levels of BCL2 that represent promising therapeutic targets. A preclinical study uh, showed that the um, 
use of this drug, ABT199 or Benetoclax, dramatically reduced the leukemic burden, uh, both in peripheral blood and not shown here, but also in bone marrow. And it extended the life span of mice sinografted with hypodiploid ALI. However, uh, pathology analysis indicated that this drug alone, a single agent, does not eradicate the leukemic clones from liver and spleen. And this is something that um, is typical for monotherapies. So because of that, it's important to identify combination therapies. So for that, first you need to have good drug that works as monotherapy, but then complement with additional ones, especially with a rational, um, so they are synergistic, uh, better than additive effects. Um, and this is what we um, did here. So the sensitivity to ABT, uh, 199 is linked to the high levels of BCL2, but also low levels of BCL itself, and high levels of beam and bad. And ABT199 can induce apoptosis with great efficacy in cells lacking beam, as we indicated. And those cells are like the ABT effect is mediated by BAL. Um, so both like beam and BAL, as well as levels of BCL2, now become biomarkers for. Uh, drug response in these cases. Um, and as we show here, the knockout of uh, CRISPR knockout of both beam or bad, uh, we're able to reduce the levels of apoptosis induced by this drug. And that was a way of proving that that's the mechanism used by this drug um, to induce uh, the cytotoxic effect. Um, so additionally, um, as I say, like the combinatorial um, effects like using an unbiased drug screen to identify another drug that could like synergize with ABT was giving us the, the basis to do combination therapies. Um, and then when we did the preclinical -clinic, pre studies, we we're able to see the synergistic effect in vivo. So with all this, I just have to acknowledge um, all the people involved in this work. Uh, first in our lab, uh, Dr. Mignon Lowe, who's the division chief and is my great mentor, has always helped me like um, in my career, as well as giving me the opportunity to um, work, starting working with these uh, patient samples when we initially decided to characterize this leukemia. Um, people who did uh, this work are mentioned here. Some of them were my technicians or like um, fellows that work with, uh, with me. Kerlin, uh, Kim, Kyle Beckman, uh, Kevin Wu, Ella Melnick, Jennifer Osman, Judy Wang, and most recently Holly Pariori, who we're going to be like submit paper very uh, soon, hopefully. Um, in the Mulligan lab, of course, Dr. Charles Mulligan and Evan Como and Linda Com Holmfeld, who did uh, the work on their side. Um, ben Brown and uh, one of his technicians, John Akutagawa and the Nolan Group, Gary Nolan and Carl Davis for um, helping us with implementing the uh, multiparametric cytometry, as well as to do additional work with CYTOF that was not included here. So with that, I would like to thank you all uh, for attending. I hope that you got um, a good understanding of what we do, as well as give you ideas on how to pursue um, a world to have a therapeutic impact uh, in the work that you are doing. Um, and with that, I will um, say goodbye until next time. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Good job. That was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. It's perfect. Um, there's just that one part I will edit out, but I think other than that, it looks to be about 40 minutes, which is, is perfect. That's great. Perfect. That's great. Yeah. So. Okay. All yeah. right. I will uh, get this ready to go for the cancer event. And then if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And if you're able to attend, um, we'd love to, to have you. Uh, if not, we'll keep you posted on attendance and so forth. Perfect. Yeah, please keep me posted. This this is great. I I didn't know about lab roots before, um, and now I think like after I found out about this, it's like it's such a great great opportunity. I mean, like the more we can spread the word in what we do, like in kind of divulgation of scientific research, 
I think um, expanding that so it's not just people who attend a particular meeting, but that you have it available online. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea. So good, good. Yeah, we. Um, I love the concept as well, and I think it's just a great, great way to get your content out to the world um, and those people that can't travel or afford to travel, and it's just a, a good mechanism for that. So thank you again. Thank you for your contribution, and we'll definitely keep you posted. Perfect. All right, Tracy. Have a great rest of the day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.